Thank you, Senator Pratt. Um, we'll now move to question time and I call Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. President, my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. When did the Albanese government first become aware of concerns within the Solomon Islands government about its financial capacity to conduct its elections on schedule in 2023? Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, um, President, and I thank uh, uh, the senator for the first, I think, the first foreign affairs question in this parliament. I appreciate his interest in Solomon Islands, and uh, obviously, uh, it's uh, a, a matter of record uh, what occurred uh, in relation to the Solomon Islands under the previous government. I'd make the point. I'm asked about electoral assistance. I, I would make the point, and he may not be aware of this, that Australia has actually been providing uh, electoral assistance to Solomon Islands for many years on the parties of both governments. Uh, so obviously the question goes to when, when, does, when did the Australian government become aware of capacity uh, to, to engage in an election? I, I will just make the point that Australia has in fact been providing assistance to the democratic processes in Solomon Islands for years. We are already partnering with Solomon Islands Electoral Office to support electoral reform and administration through, through both the Australian Electoral Commission's program uh, and the UNDP's program aimed at strengthening the electoral cycle in Solomon Islands. Uh, Australia has always taken the view uh, that uh, democracy, democratic processes and democracy matters. I would reiterate the standing offer the Australian government has to support Solomon Islands' next election, whether held in 2023 or 2024. Obviously, as I've, as I've made clear publicly, the timing of the election is entirely a matter for the government and the parliament of Solomon Islands. Uh, I would assume that my colleague, Senator Birmingham, would share the view. Uh, that democracy matters, democratic conventions are important, and that Australia's support for uh, democratic processes through the Pacific, including Solomon Islands, uh, is a matter of bipartisan support. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham, first supplementary. Thanks, President. Is it correct that the Australian government only made a formal offer of financial assistance to the Solomon Islands government less than a week ago, on the 1st of September? Why did it take so long after questions were first raised by the Solomon Islands about its financial capacity to conduct its scheduled 2023 elections for the offer of financial assistance to be made? Minister. Uh, the, uh, I don't accept some of the assertions in the question. I would again go back to my primary answer, uh, which is that uh, this, there have been uh, a long-standing practice of governments of both uh, political persuasions to provide uh, support for democratic processes in Solomon Islands. Uh, as I said, uh, we, we you know, I think recently provided support for, the, for, for PNG, and I think uh, uh, some of those opposite may have been invited to observe the election uh, process. Uh, we will support Solomon Islands uh, next election, whether held in 2023 or 2024. Uh, I would uh, indicate to the Senate that you know, obviously this is uh, an offer that has been reiterated on more than one occasion, including uh, by uh, Minister Conroy uh, as well as Thank by officials. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Birmingham, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Did the Minister advise the Government of the Solomon Islands that she was going to publicly review last week's offer of financial assistance from Australia before doing so. And how does the minister respond to assertions from the Solomon Islands government that the timing of her public disclosure is an assault on their democracy and a direct interference in a foreign government's domestic affairs? Minister. Uh, will I again make this point that support for an election which is held uh, when the Solomon Islands Parliament and Government determine that election can be, uh, uh, is uh, an offer respectful of the sovereignty of Solomon Islands. That is the, the nature of uh, uh, the answer I gave and the offer that has been made by the Australian Government. Yeah, and I, I would make this point. I understand the Shadow Minister has to ask these questions that, unlike those opposite, we have ensured 
uh, that the Prime Minister, the Foreign Minister uh, and others are um, engaging with Solomon Senator Islands Wong, rather than the, the, the ducking Wong. and weaving we saw Senator from those Wong, please resume your seat. As Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. Point of order on direct relevance. The series of questions, and particularly the supplementary question just asked, did not query the merits of the provision of financial assistance for the conduct of elections, which the minister keeps referencing. The supplementary question was specific about the public disclosure of the latest offer of financial assistance and whether the minister had conveyed her intention to publicly disclose that to the government of the Solomon Islands prior to doing so. Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham. I do believe that the minister has been relevant and I'll continue to listen for the next 16 seconds. Uh, thank you. Uh, as, as the senator knows, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, this government does seek to transparently answer questions which are made by, by journalists. We did so uh, in relation to an offer which is consistent with the practice of past and this government thank to you, support minister. democracy. Your time has expired. Senator Walsh. My question is to the Minister for Finance, representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. <coughs> Senator Gallagher. The June quarter national accounts figures were released today. Can the Minister outline to the Senate what the national accounts say about how the national economy is performing at the moment? Minister. Uh, thank you, President. I thank uh, Senator Walsh uh, for the question uh, and congratulate on her, her on her appointment as Chair of the Economics uh, Committee. Uh, Today's national accounts reflect an economy that's rebounding from the disruption of the pandemic, but is being held back by capacity constraints, skill sh shortages and declining real wages. This is a, fam a familiar story uh, that we're seeing and certainly familiar in terms of the economy and the economic challenges that we've inherited on forming government. While the headline figures are encouraging, the data released today confirm the pressures that are being felt by Australian households and that are weighing on our supply chains. The national accounts figures released today show the economy grew by 0.9 per cent in the June quarter 2022 to be 3.6 per cent higher through the year. GDP increased 3.9 per cent over the 21-22 financial year, and that growth reflected the continuing pandemic recovery and was concentrated in the services industry, particularly as this was the first full quarter of reopened domestic and international borders since the pandemic began some two years ago. The quarterly increase was driven by increases in household consumptions, uh, consumption, which was 2.2 um, per cent, net exports and new business investment, partly offset by inventories and dwelling investment. In particular, household consumption grew by 2.2 per cent in the quarter and I think uh, was 6 per cent higher through the year. Um, and contributed 1.1 per cent points to real GDP growth in the quarter. The household savings ratio fell to 8.7 per cent in June, uh, down from 1.1 per cent in March. Dwelling investment fell as most states continued to experience material, material and labour shortages, and inventories detracted from growth, driven by drawdowns from the mining industry and from agriculture. Thank you, Minister. Senator Walsh, first supplementary. Can the minister advise how the October budget will address the challenges that Australians are facing in the economy today? Minister. Thank you, uh, President. The October budget will be our way of delivering on our commitments and delivering on our economic plan. The Albanese government's economic plan is a plan to boost productivity, take the speed limit off the economy, and particularly in some of the data that we've seen in national accounts today, and build up the right kind of growth to make a meaningful dis difference on cost of living pressures for households without adding to inflationary pressures. A key element of this week, uh, this was last week's Jobs and Skills Summit, where we saw representatives from across the country come together with 36 concrete outcomes to help deal with the issues that we face. I was particularly proud of the emphasis on women during the summit, with agreement that improving women's workforce participation is critical for Australia's future economic prosperity and resilience. Of course, there's also our plans on cleaner and cheaper energy, better training and skilling our workforce, investing in cheaper childcare, upgrading the MBN to better capture the di digital economic e opportunity and creating a future thank made you, in Minister, Australia. Your time has expired. Senator Walsh, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. How will Labor's economic plan respond to the challenges that we are currently seeing in the economy and that are highlighted in the national accounts data released today? 
Thank you, Senator Walsh, and I thank you for the supplementary question. Our economic plan will address the challenges that are facing us. We know that these challenges have been made worse by nearly a decade of wasted opportunities and wrong priorities from those opposite. Our policies will put the national interest first, whether it's through our climate change policy that will address opportunities for investment, innovation and jobs, or whether it's addressing the skill shortages that are affecting different areas of the economy, particularly through our fee-free TAFE <coughs> policies, as well as measures we announced in the Jobs and Skills Summit last week, such as increasing the permanent migration ceiling to 195,000 for this financial year. And of course, there's our very significant investment, over $5 billion to make childcare cheaper, which will make <coughs> childcare more affordable for families, improve productivity and improve workforce participation. Thank you, Minister. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, President. Yeah. Uh, my yeah. question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, uh, Senator Gallagher. Um, the Albanese government's decision to expand the distribution priority area classifications to include suburbs of capital cities means towns like Mildura <coughs> are now competing with the suburbs of Melbourne for overseas doctors. The only bulk billing medical practice in Mildura has had to close because doctors can now move back to the city and have chosen to do so, leaving 15,000 patients wondering how they're going to receive adequate medical care in Mildura and the Sunraysia area. Will the minister apologise to the Mildura community for effectively cutting their health services? Senator Gallagher. <coughs> Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Madam uh, President. Sorry. <laughs> I'll get there one day. Thank you, President. And I welcome the opportunity to talk about the important role that primary health care plays in, across Australia's uh, health system. Uh, as we know, and again, this is one of the things we inherited from the last government, yep. that primary health care and the pressure of GPs has, has never been worse than it was on us Admiral, coming to government. Please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. Thank you. A point of order on relevance, uh, Chair. Um, I was actually um, specific in my question around the distribution priority areas, and I would ask you to draw the minister's attention to the, the matter that I was asking the question on. Thank you, Senator Rustin. I do believe the minister is being relevant. We are talking about GPs and primary health care, and I'll, uh, um, I will listen carefully to uh, yep. her continued yep. answer. Just uh, on the point of your ruling sure. on the point of order, um, Chair, um, I wasn't talking about primary health care. I was talking about distribution priority areas. Sure, and GP services sit within that broadband. Uh, thank you, Minister. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, the issue of um, access to doctors is directly relevant to the 24 seconds that I had in uh, giving my answer. Uh, I can assure Australians uh, that we will be doing absolutely everything we can to make access to primary health care more affordable, uh, increase access and take the pressure off GPs as they are currently experiencing it. The issues of bulk billing are serious. Access to uh, high quality primary care, if you can't get it, creates problems downstream in the health care system. I, I don't accept uh, the proposition that uh, the Shadow Minister for Health has put at the end of the question, or will we apologise? We won't apologise for actually investing more in primary health care by having um, our Medicare Minister, Task Force. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, on a point of order again, um, could I draw your attention once again to the fact that the question is specifically on only about distribution priority area changes. Uh, the minister is talking about absolutely everything else apart from addressing the specific question that I've asked her and the specific topic I've asked her about. Um, Senator Rustin, as you're aware, I can't direct the content. Order. Order. I can't direct the content of the answer, and I do believe the minister continues to be relevant. Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I am not fully briefed on the issues in Mildura, which I think is where you raised in your first question. Was it was it in Mildura? And I'm happy to come back to the Senate with if there is any further information that I can provide. But I will stand by the commitment we took in the election, which was supported by the Australian community, which was to strengthen Medicare with almost a billion dollars of investment to have our urgent care 
clinics to have $750 million into the Strengthening Medicare Fund and $220 million going direct to GPs to make sure that they can do the work we need them Senator to do. McGrath. Uh, Senator Rustin, first supplementary. Thank you, um, President. Um, well, Specifically, um, Minister, your government's decision to expand the DPA classification for international doctors and bonded medical graduates has meant that a doctor who had planned to move to Huonville in Tasmania has now decided to stay in Hobart. Will you apologise to that community for effectively cutting their health services? And maybe you could explain to us what the DPA is in your answer. <coughs> uh, Minister. Order. Order. Sarah. Order. Sarah. Uh, Senator Watt and Senator Hume. <laughs> interjections <laughs> across. <laughs> Order. Uh, Senator McGrath. Senator Watt. <laughs> Senator McGrath, I note you just accused Senator Watt of being disorderly. I wish you would take your own advice. Minister, please continue. Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you. Well, all I'd add um, to the previous answers I've given is that Labor is about getting more doctors, right. providing more doctors to more communities right. so they can see more patients cheaper. That is what we are trying to do. After nine years Order. of neglect under this government, Order. undermining Medicare, every single Minister, opportunity they could. Your seat. I'm waiting again. Thank you. Please, Minister, continue. Where was I? Um, <laughs> You're winning. You're winning. <laughs> we are about making Medicare more accessible to more people and supporting the work of general practice. So I think the slant that the shadow minister is putting on it is unfair. Our commitments are about getting more doctors into primary care, and when we've got them into primary care, supporting them um, with minister, the work that they do. Your seat. Grossly unfair. As Senator Rustin. Am I getting a point of order or the third, the second supplementary? Uh, sorry, I couldn't hear you because Senator Dunningham is busy interjecting to Senator Watt across the Dunham. chamber. <coughs> Senator Dunningham, you have your own manager on her feet. Thank you. Please continue, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, President. Can the minister explain what advice formed sorry, the— Sorry, you've now— oh, no, I, 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 I thought the minister... you were raising a point of order. I was raising order. a point of order. I was just— uh, well, sorry, could I seek whether— well, I, uh, no, I, I think, think the minister both sat down. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, unless you hadn't sat Senator down. Senator Wong. Yes. yes. <laughs> and <laughs> right. <laughs> Who's running the joint? Yes. Good question, Senator Scott. Order, order. Let's just clear the slate, and I'm calling you, uh, Senator Rustin, for your second supplementary. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, President. Can the minister please explain what advice formed the basis of your government's decision to expand the DPA classification so that it now includes suburbs of capital cities, and what consideration was given to the impact on regional, rural and remote communities this policy is meant to support, particularly given the Rural Doctors Association of Australia has said your government's changes could cost the lives of rural and remote patients? Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. And I think what the shadow minister is arguing is that we don't uh, provide additional incentives for more doctors to go to more places. Um, we are not trying to remove. We are. The policy is about getting um, more minister, doctors and incentivising. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. Um, in the interest of um, assisting the, the minister, um, are that you was raising not a point of order? Saying. She said, "Sorry, the Senator minister... Rustin, are you raising a point of order?" Yes. I would ask you to um, ask the minister not to verbal me. <clears throat> Thank you. Please continue, Minister. Thank you, Madam President. I think the shadow minister is criticising us for extending an incentives program to attract doctors to areas where there is workforce shortages. There are workforce shortages in suburbs. There are workforce shortages in Canberra. I, have, I, was, I was health minister here for eight years. We had a massive GP shortage, minister, like there is shortages in towns. Order. Order. 
Order. Senator Hughes and Senator Watt. And Senator Rustin. I want the minister to finish her answer. Thank you, Minister. I have. I have. We obviously have a different of opinion about it, but we have deliberately not changed the regional incentive uh, pro payments that doctors receive for working in remote Australia so that we don't detract from there, but we do acknowledge there Thank are shortages minister, elsewhere has which expired. matter to Senator Thorpe. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship and Multicultural Affairs, Senator Watt. Your government has recently withdrawn the appeal of Montgomery. Prior to that, an estimated 10 to 15 people asserting their sovereign Aboriginal identity were still in immigration detention. Has the Labor government released all Aboriginal people from immigration detention? And if not, when will they be released? Thank you, Senator Thorpe, Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Thorpe, for the question. This is an important issue, uh, and a significant uh, decision was made by the government to not pursue that litigation, as you're aware. Uh, I will have to get you the exact details as to the numbers that you're seeking, uh, and I'll provide that to you as quickly as I can. Senator Thorpe, uh, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for your uh, answer. Uh, my second question is, when will the Labor government reinstate the visas? of Aboriginal people released from immigration detention so as to restore the rights they held prior to the coalition government cancelling their visas. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. And again, uh, Senator Thorpe, uh, I'm happy to come back to you with the precise details of that. I am aware that there has been some action taken to implement the effect of that decision. I just want to make sure I've got the absolutely correct details before I provide them to the chamber. Senator Thorpe, second supplementary. Uh, President, thank you, Minister, for your response. Uh, and thirdly, will the Labor government include a special condition on an Aboriginal person's visa to guarantee a right of re-entry to Australia? Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister. Thank you, President. And again, thanks, Senator Thorpe. That does go beyond my knowledge as the representing minister, but again, I'm happy to come back to you as quickly as I can. Thank you, Minister. Senator Payman. Uh, my question is to Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Can the Minister update the Senate on the government's plan to make medicines cheaper for millions of Australians? Um, Minister. Uh, thank you very much, and I thank Senator uh, Payman for her question and for her extraordinary speech uh, that we were privileged to listen to yesterday. Um, the cost of living crisis that this government inherited is a decade in the making, uh, a decade in the making, and it will not be solved overnight. But the government, the Albanese government, has already hit the ground money, running, arguing for successful, successfully arguing for an increase in the minimum wage, something not argued for under them, introducing legislation which will drive investment in clean and cheaper energy and putting downward pressure on power prices, also something you could never see from a coalition government. And of course, today we are introducing legislation to make medicines cheaper for millions of Australians. For the first time in its 75-year history, the maximum cost of general scripts under the PBS will fall. On January 1 we are cutting the cost of general scripts by 29 per cent, with the maximum cost to drop by $12.50, dropping the price from $42.50 to $30. This will save someone taking one medication a month $150 a year, a family with two or three medications $300 to $450 a year. And we know patients continue to tell community pharmacies of the increasing pressures of having to choose between food on the table and medicine for their family. This morning at Capital Chemist in Kingston, the Prime Minister met Greg, a single dad whose son lives with diabetes, type 1 diabetes, and Greg told the Prime Minister that the government's plan to cut the cost of medicine will make an enormous difference to his family. 
an enormous difference. It will ensure he can continue to afford the life-saving life medicine his son needs. So I, I, what I say to those opposite who are interjecting about how long it's taken, you know, we, we've been in government for just over 100 days. You were in government for about 3,000 days. So, but we are the ones who Thank are actually you, introducing legislation. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Order. Senator Payman, our first supplementary. Fabulous response, Minister. Thank you. How will my first supplementary? My first supplementary question is: How will Australians benefit from making medicines cheaper? Minister. Thank you, uh, President. Well, the maximum cost for, to general patients for PBS medications has doubled since the year 2000. And of course, regrettably for Australians, those opposite, when in government, did so little to help. Did so little help. In fact, the ABS advises that the high cost of medications on your watch—you don't like the truth, do you? Don't like the truth. A close, the ABS advises that a million Australians were delayed or didn't fill their medications in 2019-20. They were left in the lurch by the coalition. Cutting the maximum price by nearly one third will mean more people can afford to get the medications they need to stay healthy. And the change will put close to $200 million back in the pockets of Australians each year, the same Australians who are left in the lurch by a coalition who was more interested in political games than Thank delivering you, Minister, for Australia. Your time has expired. Senator, Senator Payman, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Um, Minister, how many Australians will benefit from these changes to the PBS? Minister Wong. Thank you, President. Well, approximately 19 million Australians are eligible to benefit for this change, with about 3.6 million, million Australians to immediately benefit once the legislation comes into effect. And those of us on this side understand that making medicines cheaper will ease the squeeze on household budgets for so many Australians. But you know, one difference also. In a di another difference between us and them is we on this side understand that Medicare and the PBS are the foundations of Australia's world-class healthcare system. And you know why we understand that? Because they're labour reforms. They're labour reforms, both initiatives of labour governments. And it is only labour governments that make these nation-building reforms to transform the lives of Australians. The PBS, a legacy of Curtin and Chif the Curtin and Chifley governments, and of course Medicare, a legacy of the Hawke government. This government will continue to strengthen both Medicare Thank you, and PBS. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Hanson. Senator Hanson for the second time. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Senator Wong. Would the Minister please explain in, to the Australian people and I what net zero emissions actually means in layman's terms? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister. Uh, I'm not sure how to explain it other than to say it means net zero. There's, there's, I mean, um, you know, I think, and 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 I understand that the senator. It's one of those situations. I I I, I will I'll think through if I can uh, provide a, 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 an explanation that makes it clearer than that. But to me, the words net zero are quite clear. Uh, I think we all Order. understand what net emissions Order. means. Um, uh, I am reminded of a, a time when I was climate minister and I think Senator Fielding uh, wanted uh, an explanation and I, I got in the chief scientist uh, to try and take him through it and we did get to a point where I thought I don't actually know uh, and neither did she at that time how, how to break it down any further but I, I will have a think about that. Uh, I think it's a commonly understood objective and it's an objective that, as the senator knows that is shared by those opposite I thought. Maybe not. Uh, well, obviously not Senator Canavan, I know that, Your but policy, the coalition, I thought broadly, had, had agreed to net zero emissions by 2050. Uh, yeah, and that was your policy. Oh, well, may, maybe Senator Canavan is indicating a change in policy under the yeah. coalition, uh, under Mr Dutton. 
uh, and uh, and uh, obviously, uh, I think it's 84 per cent. I could be wrong. Oh, yeah. Australia's exporters have also, sorry, export markets have already signed up to the same target it was discussed at the G20. So there's broad global agreement about the need um, to, to. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, um, uh, Madam President. Uh, just on, on relevance there. Uh, the question was clearly about uh, the definition of a term. It was a very simple question. And now we're talking about uh, what other countries are doing and signing um, up to. It's totally Canavan, it's got nothing no to do with the original question. Uh, Minister, did you wish to continue? Senator Wong, have uh, you finished your first question no, for the answer? Um, Senator Hanson, first supplementary. Well, actually, I'm gobsmacked from the first answer. I don't know whether I, I don't know whether I should actually ask the second one. Now you got me. Now, all right. Well, then, how much will the government policy to reduce emissions by 43%, which you don't know what net zero is anyway, by 2030? I would really like, like to know how much it's going to cost the government by 2050. But it, I doubt I'm going to get an answer on the first one. But if you can answer my question. How much is it going to cost the Australian taxpayers to for this um, reduced Hansen, emissions by 43 per cent? Uh, please resume your seat, Minister. Uh, well, th thank you, um, President. Thank you to Senator uh, Hanson for the question. Uh, and she may be aware uh, that the Labor Party in opposition did model this uh, 43 per cent uh, reduction by 2030 uh, policy. Uh, and issued the modelling uh, transparently, and that modelling showed that the plan, uh, which includes a 43 per cent reduction, would in fact create 604,000 jobs, with five out of six new jobs to be created in the region, that it would spur $76 billion of investment, and it would deliver, it would deliver an 82 per cent renewable energy by 2030. So I think what, what we have seen, what we have seen uh, is uh, uh, Power, generating capacity exiting the, energy, the energy generation system over the life of the, 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 those, the government of those opposite. Uh, and that reduction in supply without new capacity coming on stream is, is central to why power prices Thank you, Minister, are doing what they are doing. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Hanson, second supplementary. How is the government's plan to bring more than a million immigrants to Australia in the next five years consistent with efforts to reduce emissions? Thank you, Hans uh, Senator Hanson. Minister. Well, I think, well, first, uh, I'm not sure about the figure, but we, we have, uh, as a result of the Jobs and Skills Summit, indicated 195,000 um, um, uh, places, uh, uh, and that is as a, as a consequence uh, of the capacity constraints in the economy and the skills crisis that uh, we, we, we know yeah, from talking to business and if you look at the data uh, ex exists. Uh, but you know, the focus will be on permanent skill migration and that will add to the capacity of the Australian economy. Uh, it's important to recall that one of the things that we all have to do, and Australia will have to do, is to ensure that the link between GDP and populations and emissions uh, is, is that they are delinked, uh, and that we can continue to grow our economy in ways that don't continue uh, to produce as many emissions. And, and the way we do that is by uh, these sorts of investments in renewable energy that Thank our plan you, Minister, will deliver. Your time has expired, Senator Reynolds. So my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Social Services, uh, Senator Farrell. My question is why is the government's temporary announcement to support pensioners to keep most of what they earn time limited to the end of this financial year? Thank you, Senator Reynolds. Um, minister. Uh, thank you, um, President, and uh, thank uh, the, um, uh, the senator for her, uh, her question. Um, <coughs> I think it's fair to say that uh, this government is doing uh, so much more for uh, pensioners, uh, even in its first uh, couple of months, than uh, you've done in the uh, previous uh, your previous uh, <coughs> ten years. Um, and uh, we're going to continue. We're going to continue uh, down this track to. Try and uh, improve the lives of uh, 
Australian uh, pensioners. Uh, that you, um, um, Minister, please resume your seat. Yep. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you. Point of order, President, uh, on direct relevance. My question was very clear and specific. It was, why is it time limited to the end of this financial year? Thank you, uh, Senator Reynolds. Um, the minister has started to talk about pensioners, and like you, I'm listening carefully. And we will um, order, order, order. Minister Farrell, please continue. Thank you, President, and uh, thank, uh, thank the, the uh, senator for her uh, intervention. <coughs> um, uh, look. Um, as I uh, made very clear in the few few seconds I had to uh, answer this question before uh, I was rudely rudely interrupted by Senator Reynolds, Nine. we we are going to do more. Exactly. We're going to do more in the time that uh, we have in the government than your government did in the previous uh, ten years. Um, these are these are issues. These are issues. These, these are issues that, uh, of course, are uh, constantly uh, under review by uh, the, the, minister, the Minister for um, Social uh, Services. Um, and, uh, we, uh, uh, minister, please resume your seat. Senator Birmingham. President, it's, uh, it's a point of order on relevance. It's agonising that uh, Minister Farrell can't get beyond the broad concept of pensioners and hasn't even turned to the actual policy proposal of the government, which is a copy of part of an opposition policy proposal uh, for an extension of pensioner work rights, when the precise question from Senator Reynolds was about those pensioner work rights and why the government has adopted it only to the end of the financial Thank year. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. And, uh, in the time remaining, I will direct the minister to the specifics of the question. Thank you, minister. They, 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 Order. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, President. Thank you, President. Um, as as the Prime Minister has said time and time again, and as thank you, Minister, the, time has expired. <laughs> Senator Reynolds, first supplementary. Uh, thank thank you very much, President. I do have a supplementary question, and in fact. Given that uh, the minister representing the Minister for Social Services didn't answer the question, I ask him the same question again. Um, can the minister please uh, explain why it is only time limited until the end of this year? Thank you, Senator Reynolds. Um, minister. Thank you, uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, the senator for her supplementary Order. question. As I as I started to uh, to say before, uh, I. Uh, was required I'm to sit sorry, down. Minister. Could you resume your seat? Sorry. I'm waiting until there's quiet before I call the minister back up. Or oh, Senator Brown, Senator Brown, I've just called the chamber to order. That includes you, um, Minister. Please continue. <coughs> thank you, uh, Madam President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Reynolds for her question. Um, we, this, this government continues to do whatever we can to assist Australian pensioners in a way that the previous government never ever did. Uh, and uh, one, of the, one of the ways in which we're uh, doing that, of course, is that uh, uh, we're strengthening the... Um, Minister Farrell, uh, sit, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator order Reynolds. on direct relevance. Uh, I've given the minister representing the minister uh, two opportunities now to answer a very simple question. And if I could ask that you uh, remind the minister of the question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Reynolds. And I will remind uh, the minister of the question, but I, I think he was going to, in the next breath, um, answer it before, before the point of order was called. Thank you, minister. Thank you, President, and uh, thank, uh, thank uh, Senator Reynolds for her constant uh, interruption. Um, what I would that will be the next question, uh, Senator. Um, we continue to try and assist and make life easier for pensioners in this thank country, you, and that's Carol, why we are.
Order. Order. Senator Reynolds, second supplementary. Thank you very much, President. And uh, given in the first two questions, I didn't get a straight answer. I was going to ask whether they would look to extend it beyond July of this year, given there is a great need. However, I will ask the same question again. And, President, I noted that Senator Wong said she had the answer, so maybe you might like to hand it over to Senator Farrell. Um, but the question again is, uh, why is it just time limited? Why, in a policy, is Thank it time limited Reynolds, until the end of this year? Uh, it is not helpful when senators, particularly those on my right, call out time. Thank you. Uh, Minister. Minister. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President, and thank uh, the uh, senator for her uh, supplementary uh, question. Um, well, I, uh, one observation I would make, uh, Senator, is that uh, there is a facility uh, under, the, uh, under the decision that's been made for uh, and to extend the period of time in, uh, um, in extenuating uh, circumstances. So I think your, uh, your general principle is not completely accurate in the sense that there, are, uh, there is an ability under the, uh, under the proposal uh, to... I'll give him a chance. Uh Minister, uh, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, President. Again, a point of order on direct relevance. Um, again, I'll just remind uh, you, President, of the question. Why is it just time limited to the end of this financial year? Third time lucky, I'm hoping, in the last 20 seconds. Thank you, Senator Reynolds. Um, the minister was being relevant, and I'll call the minister again. Thank you. Um, look, uh, I've, Senator I've, Smith. We're doing what we I've, can. Minister, I've, tried, I've, I've tried to be as directly relevant uh, as I can, uh, <laughs> President. Um, the proposition that's being put to me by the senator is not correct. Thank there you. is an ability under the proposal in extenuating circumstances you, to minister, extend the period— Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, President. My question is to Minister Watt, representing the Minister for Early Childhood Education. Today, thousands of early childhood educators around the country have walked out of centres. The low pay and difficult conditions these workers are subjected to are a national shame. Educators deserve professional pay that reflects the skill and responsibility of the work that they do every single day. But instead of immediately committing the funding necessary to lift these w uh, workers' wages, the Labour government is going ahead with the stage three tax cuts for the wealthy. Tax cuts that economists tell us will overwhelmingly flow to men as well. Why is the government sticking with the obscene stage three tax cuts when you should be using the money to lift wages of early educators and carers who are mostly women? Uh, thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Wong? Point, point of order, um, uh, and S Senator Watt may well, President, be quite willing to answer those bits within his portfolio. But um, a question on tax cuts, just because it is juxtaposed with a political statement about childcare, does not make this part of the portfolio that Senator Watt is representing. If the, if the, if the, senator, well, if the senator wants to may ask questions about tax cuts, they're obviously uh, they're rep representing ministers who can be asked. But I make the point that the, the, the responsibility uh, is uh, is not in the portfolio to which the question is addressed. Now, obviously, the remedy is, is the senator can answer the, the minister can answer the question insofar as it relates to his, the portfolio he's representing. Uh, thank you, Senator Wong. I'm responding to the point of order, Senator Fruki. Um, I just remind senators that uh, questions do need to be addressed to the correct portfolio holder. Um, did you have a point of order, Senator Fruki? I do. I just this is a question about childcare and childcare workers and early educators and workers and their pay. And if the minister who represents the minister for early education and care can't respond to that, then I'm not sure what to do about it, to um, be frank. Senator Faruqi, uh, just a moment, Senator Wong. Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Faruqi, that was not the totality of the question. And as the point of order by Senator Wong went to the issue of tax cuts, which is indeed um, another portfolio holder. Um, so that you don't have a point of order, I'm going to go to Senator Watt now to answer 
whatever part of the question that relates to his portfolio. Senator thank, thank you, President, uh, and thank you, Senator Faruqi. Uh, Senator Wong, of course, is correct that um, if you go back and look at the question that was asked, it was about tax cuts, but I'm certainly happy to talk about uh, early childhood educators, uh, a group in our community who I very much value, and everyone on this side of the chamber very much values. Uh, and it's particularly appropriate uh, that we be talking about these issues today, because today, of course, is Early Childhood Educators Day. Uh, and that's why not long after question time, I and no doubt many of my colleagues here will be going to meet with early childhood educators on the front lawns of the parliament. Uh, and I would certainly encourage every, every worker, uh, every uh, uh, member of parliament to do the same thing. Um, Labor has long recognised uh, the problems regarding the low pay of early childhood educators. Um, and I certainly know that from personal experience in terms of my children and the early childhood education they received. Uh, I've actually spent time in early childhood centres uh, with educators observing the work that they do, which is incredibly demanding and incredibly valuable, and that's why they do deserve a pay rise. Uh, and that's exactly why our government is committed to reinvigorating bargaining so that we can improve productivity but also grow wages, particularly in the sectors like this, like early childhood. Uh, that's why our government has successfully argued for a pay rise for the lowest paid workers in Australia, a pay rise I might admit and acknowledge that those opposite opposed. Um, on 1 July this year, the Fair Work Commission minimum rates order increased pay rates in modern awards, including the Children's Services Award, by 4.6 per cent, something that our government called for in a submission, a pay rise for the lowest paid workers in our community, including early childhood educators. We know the work of women has long been undervalued, and that is definitely the case for the early childhood education and care sector, where more than 90 per cent of the workforce are women, and we will keep Thank acting you, on this. Senator Watt. Your time has expired. Senator Faruqi, first supplementary. Minister Watt, in your own Facebook posts as far back as 2018, you have described early childhood educators as grossly underpaid and identified the wage discrimination that exists for traditionally female-dominated workplaces. You know that the pandemic and workforce shortages have made the crisis worse. So why have you given up? When will you commit? When will you commit to giving early childhood education workers the immediate pay rise that they deserve? Thank you, Senator. And Faruqi, make early education free for all. Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Faruqi, and, and I thank you for acknowledging my consistency of position when it comes to the fact that early childhood educators are grossly underpaid, something that the former government did absolutely nothing about, and something I might say the Greens will never have the opportunity to do something about not being a party of government. The only party that will ever be responsible for delivering an, a wage rise to early childhood educators is a Labor government, and that is exactly what we are doing right now. This notion that we have given up on this issue could not be further from the truth. As I say, already since we have been in office, the Fair Work Commission minimum rates order increased pay rates in modern awards, including the Children's Services Award, by 4.6 per cent. And that, of course, followed a Labor government making a submission to the Fair Work Commission arguing for a pay rise for those lowest paid amongst our community. I am very happy to put my credentials as a supporter of early childhood educators up against any member of the Greens, any member of the opposition, and I know that everyone on this side Thank of the you. chamber would do the uh, same Senator thing. Senator Watt, your time has expired. Senator Faruqi, second Min supplementary. Thank you. Minister Ward, I've spoken with early childhood workers about the burnout that they are facing their rising workloads and the low pay that is causing many to leave the sector. There is no time to waste on your vague plans and distant timelines. We need action and they need action right now. When will the government bring in legislation in this parliament to lift wages, to improve conditions and to deal with the critical workforce shortages in early learning and care? Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Minister. Um, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Faruqi. I know that, whatever the issue, um, the Greens' tactic is to get up and make speeches demanding something when it's actually Labor governments who deliver those things. And for the third time, for the third time, I can point out that in the very short time 
this government has been in office, we have delivered a pay rise to the lowest paid in our community, including early childhood educators. It might suit the Greens' frame to say that nothing is happening, but it's already happened and we've been barely in office for 100 days. And that's before we get to the changes to bargaining that we expect to make an even bigger difference to the lowest paid in our community, including early childhood educators. Uh, I don't just speak to early childhood educators. I'm a member of the union that represents early childhood educators, the United Workers' Union, who have a proud record of backing in those early childhood educators for years. With the support of Labor, we are already delivering and we will continue to do more because these people deserve a pay rise. Thank you, Minister. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. President, my question is to the Minister for Tourism and, uh, and the, minister, uh, the Minister representing the Minister for Social Services, Senator Farrell. Minister, the last few years have been incredibly difficult for the tourism industry, which was then further exacerbated by the former government's near constant delays and inaction. How did the Albanese government ensure the sector was an integral part of the Jobs and Skills Summit? Minister. Thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator uh, uh, Urquhart for that question. Uh, and of course, she's absolutely right. Um, very few industries have uh, had it as tough as the tourism and travel sector over the last uh, couple of years. From bushfires, floods, the pandemic, the industry has weathered significant challenges uh, which have Im impacted the uh, business's ability uh, to retain and to recruit staff. Uh, those in the sector understand that skill shortages were an issue before the pandemic but have been exacerbated uh, by the ongoing uncertainty and lack of action by the previous government. <coughs> Hearing their voices and working together on solutions uh, is and will continue to be a priority for the Albanese Labor government. To this end, last week I was joined by almost 100 tourism and travel stakeholders who detailed their challenges and how the lack of staff is limiting their recovery uh, for, from the uh, pandemic. Throughout the sessions, we discussed suggestions and opportunities to solve these problems. Um, and those were then fed through to the Jobs and Skills uh, Summit. President, unlike the previous government, who were more focused on their own jobs than the tourism sector, come on, respond, <laughs> respond. <laughs> Do say something. Don't just sit there. Don't just sit there. The Albanese government, the Albanese government is committed to supporting the visitor economy and addressing the skills crisis, yeah, which is yeah. limiting their recovery. We understand, the, we, understand, we understand the value of tourism and tra the, right. the tourism and travel sector, right. and we want to see a return uh, as a heart of the, uh, uh, our economic uh, uh, narrative, particularly in the great state of Tasmania. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Uh, yeah. Senator Urquhart, first supplementary. Thank you, President. As the minister is aware, the overwhelming majority of tourism businesses are small and medium-sized. How will they benefit from the outcomes of the Jobs and Skills Summit? That's right. Minister. Thank you, President, and I thank uh, the Senator, Senator for once again her important question. Uh, it's true that the majority of tourism and travel businesses are small to medium businesses in this country, with 95 per cent of all businesses employing uh, fewer than five people, and that's particularly the case in the state of uh, Tasmania. This offers both challenges and significant opportunities for these dynamic and resilient businesses. The Albanese Labor government um, has heard the feedback of these small and medium businesses and have announced uh, a number of measures following the Jobs and Skills Summit, which will provide uh, assistance. Uh, this includes <coughs> uh, an announcement uh, uh, that uh, has been made, uh, along with the Minister of Social uh, Security, Amanda Rishworth, of the establishment of the Visitor Economy Disability Pilot to help people living with disability secure jobs in tourism. In addition, <coughs> tourism businesses will benefit from those changes, which Thank you, would Minister. enable the pensioners. Time has expired. <coughs> Senator Urquhart, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, Minister, building on the Jobs and Skills Summit, can you please provide some further details of this week's announcement to connect people with disability that you just talked about to meaningful work in the tourism sector? Minister. Thank you, President, and thank uh, the Senator once again for her question. As mentioned uh, earlier, today, as a result of the uh, Jobs and uh, Skills Summit, 
I joined the uh, Minister of Social Secu Security, Amanda Rishworth, in announcing a $3.3 million visitor economy disability pilot to help people living with disabilities secure sustained jobs in tourism. The pilot uh, will address uh, barriers previously identified by small and medium-sized business, tourism businesses in recruiting, retaining and progressing staff with disabilities. This includes a lack of time and capability to recruit people living with disability confusion on how and where to seek support and employment services provided focusing on supporting job seekers only rather than uh, on uh, employers. We know that 88% uh, of people living with disability uh, and those uh, who work <coughs> don't actually need the modifications on their uh, workplaces to do so. President, employ Thank you, Minister. The time has expired. Senator Hume. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. I refer the Minister to the questions asked of the Prime Minister and the Minister for Regional Development, Local Government and Territories in the other place. Can the Minister please confirm that the Minister for Regional Development, Local Government and Territories has breached the Prime Minister's ministerial code of conduct? Minister. Thank you, um, President, and, uh, and I thank the Senator for her question. And obviously, I've been here, so I haven't listened to every word that has been uh, uttered in the other place. And with all due respect to, to my senatorial colleague, I, I'm not necessarily going to uh, take as read her assertion about what has been said. But I, I would make the point that the opposition. Uh, in their attack on this is seeking that this government uphold a standard they never did. That's right. A, a standard they never did. You never did it in government and never in opposition. Never in government and never in opposition. And the reality is, is we have strengthened the ministerial code of conduct so that ministers are not able to hold shares of blind trust. And if you had this standard in government, would you like to know who would be in breach? The Leader of the Opposition would be in breach. The Leader of the National Party would be in breach. The Shadow Treasurer would be in breach. The Manager of um, Opposition Minister, Business would be in breach. Please, I know the truth hurts, Minister, doesn't it, Senator? Minister, please resume your seat. Thank you. A point of order, Madam President, and that's direct relevance. I only asked whether it was true that the Minister for Regional Development, Local Government and Territories has breached the Prime Minister's ministerial code of conduct, the current Prime Minister's Prime Ministerial Code Thank of Conduct. Thank you, Senator Hume. Uh, I do believe the Minister is being relevant. It is a question about the Code. Um, Minister. Well, I'm asked about the Ministerial Code of Conduct and breaches of same or alleged breaches of same, and I make the point that the Code of Conduct that applies uh, to, the, to the executive under this government is a standard that those opposite, including Senator Hume, never held themselves to. Never held themselves to. Uh, so uh, I would I would make that point uh, that point. Uh, uh, I, um, well, I, Minister, please resume your seat. Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Senator Wong, I'm sorry that was an imputation on me directly on me, Thank and you. I don't think you've actually read my register of interest, because then you'd see that, unlike uh, many Senator people Hume, on your side of the chamber, I don't Senator, own any shares. Senator I don't Hume, own any shares. This is not an shares opportunity there. for debate. Um, Minister Wong. I acknowledge uh, it was not intended in the way it was. It obviously was heard, and I, uh, I withdraw that. Thank you. I do withdraw that. and uh, I've always taken the view it's just easier not to own anything as well. Um, but uh, I, I would make that point. Uh, I, I'm sure the Prime Minister has answered whatever questions that the Leader of the Opposition or uh, his tactics team have put to the Prime Minister. We've made clear uh, that the Ministerial Code uh, does require— uh, um, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Birmingham. President, I, I note the Leader of the Government the Senate has spoken generically about the Ministerial Code, made a number of other assertions irrelevant to the question, but has spoken about the Code. However, there was a direct question about whether a minister has breached the Code. Uh, the Leader of the Government indicates that she's not aware of the precise details. In the 13 seconds remaining, she should take the question on notice so she can provide a direct answer to the direct question. Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham. I'm, I'm struggling with your point of order. I accept that you acknowledge the minister is answering the question. Um, I note the comments you made in relation to her most recent statement. Um, I don't believe that's a point of order, but it's up to Senator Wong whether she takes it on notice or not. Minister. 
Thank you. Uh, as is my practice, uh, I will obviously provide more information if I am able to the Chamber. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Hume, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam President. When did the Minister for Regional Development, Local Government and Territories first contact the Prime Minister or his office to notify of a breach of the Prime Minister's Ministerial Code of Conduct? If you don't have the date exactly, Senator Wong, you can also return to the Chamber with that. Um, Minister. I think in opposition we asked quite a number of questions which went to you know, what the knowledge uh, of the minister uh, that the senator here in this chamber is representing. Uh, obviously, this is one of those. Uh, if I can provide further information about, about that, I will, I will do so. Thank you, Senator Wong. Um, Senator Hume, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. The Code of Conduct for Ministers was published online on 8 July 2022. Did the Minister for Regional Development, Local Government and Territories take any action to comply with the Prime Minister's Code of Conduct before media reported on her breach almost two months later? Minister. Uh, uh, again, uh, I will. Uh, obviously, that's not something I have any personal knowledge of. But uh, I again uh, will see if there's any further information I can find. It, it is the Prime Minister's expectation uh, that ministers uh, do comply with the code. Uh, that that is, he's made that clear uh, both privately and publicly. I would also make the point. Uh, I would also make the point that this is a high standard that has been applied uh, uh, in. Uh, in the Commonwealth of Australia for nearly a decade. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, it's a different standard to the standard that was applied by those opposite. Um, and on that basis, President, on that basis, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Cards, we're out of time. Senator Hume. Uh, Senator Hume, please resume your seat. Uh, the minister had finished answer. Senator Hume. Senator Hume. Order. 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 Senator Hume, the minister had finished her answer and asked order. I am giving a direction. It is not a debating point. Senator Wong had finished her question and had then asked that further evidence, further questions being put on notice. There is no point of order. Thank you, Senator Hume. I'm not entertaining further points of order on that matter. Sure. Happy to do so. Ha Senator Hume, I am happy to do so. There re Please resume your seat. Please resume your seat. I would ask senators in this place to respect the direction I give. I accept that you may not like the direction, but you need to accept it. I have agreed to review the tape. I do not need you to keep talking when I've asked you specifically to sit down. Thank you. Senator Watt. Senator Watt. Thank you, President. I have uh, a couple of answers to the questions that were asked by Senator Thorpe. Is now the appropriate time to respond to that? Certainly. Thank you. Uh, Senator Thorpe, I have some partial answers to your questions. I may have to come back with some further answers tomorrow. Uh, in relation to your first question, uh, of course, the Montgomery case that you're referring to follows some similar litigation, the Love and Tom's cases, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, since the High Court's judgment in Love and Tom's, and as at the 29th of August this year, 13 non-citizens have been released from immigration detention on the basis that they meet or the detaining officer suspects they meet the tripartite test. Five non-citizens have been released from immigration detention directly or indirectly as a result of court judgments concerning whether it was reasonable for officers to suspect non-citizens were aliens in particular circumstances but did not involve conclusions that they meet the tripartite test. These individuals may still be required to be detained in the future in the event further inquiries demonstrate more conclusively they do not meet the tripartite test and they do not hold visas. Uh, in relation to your second question, uh, the Department of Home Affairs continues to manage individual cases that raise claims of meeting the tripartite test 
and continues to reconsider the implications of the High Court's decision for Commonwealth programs in consultation with other Australian government departments, including the Attorney-General's Department, the National Indigenous Australians Agency, the Department of Finance and the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. In relation to your third question, there are currently no plans to alter the visa scheme to introduce special conditions. As I say, if those responses don't fully answer your questions, I'll come back with some further detail. And as I've mentioned to you, I'd encourage you to have some discussions with Minister Giles about those issues. Um, in addition, uh, Deputy President, yesterday in question time, I took answers asked by Senator Canavan on notice in my capacity as the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry relating to biosecurity. I have written to Senator Canavan to provide additional information, and I table my letter to Senator Canavan for the information of all senators. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, President. Yesterday in question time, I undertook to seek further advice on questions asked by Senator Tyrrell to me in her capacity, uh, in my capacity as the Minister representing uh, the Prime Minister relating to the Australian Future Leader for Leaders Foundation. I have written to Senator Tyrrell to provide additional information, and I table my letter for the information of all senators. Senator O'Sullivan. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Deputy President, beg your pardon. I move to take note of the uh, of the answer given by Senator Gallagher to the question asked by Senator Rustin on uh, on the DPA and uh, and health. Now, the Albanese government's recent decision to expand the classification of the distribution priority area to include suburbs of state capital cities frankly, is more bad news for regional Australia. Indeed. Regional communities from my state of Western Australia who are already struggling, already struggling to get doctors will now have to compete with large metropolitan areas. The whole idea of the DPA was to identify areas experiencing low, lower areas of GP services and provide unique channels and incentives for them to be able to attract uh, GPs and to be able to retain them in these areas. Now, three areas in Western Australia where the, the Labor government have now granted full or partial DPA status include Quinana, Kalamunda and Brigadoon. Now, for those not familiar with Perth, these, are, these suburbs are actually hardly even considered outer metropolitan suburbs. In fact, I live just south, just north, like of the of one of these places, and this is hardly hardly a, a regional area, certainly not a remote area. And what is the government doing? What is the government doing? It's just going to bring and draw in, of course, people to work in these areas. Now, I'm not at all disputing the fact that there would be need for GPs and for GP services. In these, uh, in these localities across, across Perth and indeed across Australia, where the other locations, uh, we know that Fishwick is, is listed. Now it's just down the road from here. Uh, Tugradong is another one, just, just down the road down here, not too far at all. Not too far at all. I mean, now there might be, there might be need for GPs, but I can tell you, Mr. Deputy President, you need to come for a drive around Western Australia to some of the regional communities that are in desperate need for adequate services, adequate services provided by GPs. You don't have to even go that far, but you go out to, to somewhere like uh, uh, up in the Kimberley across the Halls Creek, Fitzroy Crossing, Kununurra. Now, how do these places attract staff, attract GPs and GP services? If you, the, those incentives that are designed to support those communities and those regional areas, if you're if you've just providing those same incentives, those same initiatives, right there in the capital cities, I've got no doubt that these locations may be struggling to attract and retain GPs, but it should not be at the expense of GPs leaving regional and remote areas of Western Australia who are already battling already battling to ensure that they're able to access sufficient health services. It's not too difficult to work out in general the health status of people declines the more remote they are, the, more f the further they are from capital cities. Therefore, it's hard to imagine that the changes that the government has made will, will strengthen the ability for West Australians 
in, in regional and remote areas to be able to access GP services and how it will be able to be improved. Now, what we know, I'm wondering if there's going to, we're going to start to see a pattern here. We know that when the government, when the Labor Party was last in government, they, they started to really tinker with the health services. Uh, one of the things they tinkered with a lot was the pharmaceutical benefits scheme, where we saw the delisting of medicines, the delisting of medicines on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. Yet we have, while we were in government, the whole time that uh, I was uh, in this place, I was sitting on the other side, uh, for every day of the last term, we listed an equivalent of one new medicine for every day of the last term. Now, I don't know about you, Senator Rennick, but I, it's one of the great things that I'm proud of that we were able to achieve as new senators in this place to see that happen, to see that track record. Because yeah. yeah. we know that this mob on the other side, they don't have the ability to be able to manage the books. They don't have the ability to be able to manage the affairs of this government appropriately. What Australians need is a government that's actually sensible about the needs, about the services that are required, are prepared to stand up, are prepared to do what's necessary, and not just rob Peter to pay Paul to provide the services that are required. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. It's exactly what we're seeing here. What we need is services in the bush, and all this is doing is taking Thank away you, Senator from Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Green. Thank you. Um, sometimes it's difficult to understand whether the opposition understands what a DIXA is, because this question is an opportunity for those on this side to talk about the appalling history under the Morrison government of the treatment of Medicare and GPs, particularly in rural and regional areas, and what our government is doing to fix the mess that you left. Let me break this down for you. Let me break this down for you. You so utterly baroque the Medicare system and the reliance on GPs that it was so incredibly difficult for people to see a GP in rural and regional areas that now, now we have a situation where we have had to step in and make sure that people can see a GP. But it's very, very interesting, very interesting to see from those opposite that they are opposed to the use of distribution priority areas. Because I am wondering whether senators on this side have consulted with members of their own party, because I know that in, in Queensland, Cairns is a distribution priority area. The member of Leichhardt hasn't opposed that listing. Townsville has a DPA status. The member for Herbert hasn't um, opposed that listing. Mackay has DPA status. The Whit Sundays certainly haven't seen that happen from the member for Dawson. And Harvey Bay has DPA status under the Labor government. And we know that that means that the member for Hinkler must be very supportive of our policy. But it is clear that under the Liberal National Government, the former Morrison government, that at every opportunity that they had, they ripped out funding from Medicare. They made it harder to see a GP. They, we know that they froze the Medicare rebate for six years. And if you speak to a GP, whether they're in the city or the bush, they will tell you that the former government ripped the heart out of Medicare when they froze the rebate. They went so as far as to cut access to telehealth appointments for regional Australians. And they also made sure that people living in places like Emerald were waiting 12 weeks to see a GP. Now, we had a Senate inquiry and we put that motion to this place and those opposite who are going to get up today and talk about access to GPs voted against that inquiry because you said that there was no problem. There was no issue, nothing to see here. There was no, no problem to be fixed. But when we held that inquiry, initiated by Labor, we heard horrible stories from people around the country about the treatment that you lot put them up to so that they couldn't see a GP. That is why, that is why a Labor government is strengthening Medicare. And we were very clear at the election and we were supported at the election to form a government with the core value of strengthening Medicare and protecting it. We will be delivering urgent care clinics in regional areas and across the country. 
We have developed the Strengthening Medicare Task Force, an important opportunity to bring so many people around the table to fix this workforce issue caused by your former government. And we have delivered DPA access to areas that are in desperately in need of GPs. We will not stand here and be lectured by a government, by a political party that sacked nurses in Queensland. Queenslanders will never forget that. And we know that Queenslanders are so pleased that we finally have a government that values Medicare. I won't, be, I won't stand here as someone who lives in a regional area and be lectured to by those opposite about who cares about access to GPs and Medicare. And I notice that the previous speaker raised the issue of medicines. Well, I have fantastic news for you, because today we have announced that we will be making medicines cheaper for millions of Australians. This is a fantastic step forward. The first time in 75 years, the first time in 75 years, I, are you opposed? Are you opposed to having cheaper medicines? Because there is a choice here. You can support that policy or you can be opposed to it. But we know that, this, that on this side of the chamber, our government is making medicines cheaper. We will be introducing legislation. You'll have the opportunity to support that legislation to make sure that people have access to the medicines that they need. Because Labor built Medicare and we will always protect it. You tried to rip the heart out of Medicare. You made it harder to see a GP. That is why our Labor government is fixing it. And we will always stand here on our record. And it is completely, complete rubbish from your side of politics to lecture us about access to GPs Thank in you, rural Senator and regional Green. areas. Senator Rennick. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President. And I suggest uh, Senator Green go back and actually do some study on the history of health care in this country. I stand here as the son of a maternity, uh, a maternity nurse, a midwife, and, a G and, and, and she had a general ticket as well. And she actually uh, worked in many hospitals in four states, as a matter of fact. She did a training at St Vincent's in 1953 in Sydney. And um, would you— uh, Senator Green, please restrain yourself. But Senator Rennick, you did, you did give some commentary during Senator Green's— um... Well, I've actually got something important to say because I actually know the history of healthcare in this country. And let me tell you, the state governments have taken advantage of the good nature that uh, Medicare was set up for, and they have cost-shifted from the states onto the federal government. And I know that because when I grew up and had to go and see a doctor, I would sit in a thing called outpatients in a public hospital. Now, they, that's been renamed emergency. And the reason why they renamed it emergency is so that people don't go to emergency and the state governments want it that way because then they don't have to pick up the cost. By sending it to a doctor in the primary health care system, they get the federal government to pick up the cost. Now, the problem with that is that has overloaded the system on, on the, doc, uh, the doctors. And what we need in this country are more doctors on fixed salaries and we need the, the public health system in the state system actually to be honest, we need to go further than this. We need to actually get one level of government trying to run healthcare in this country because we're getting this cost shifting all the time in this blame game between federal and state governments and this, uh, ambiguous re these re ambiguous responsibilities result in nothing but name calling rather than problem solving. And um, Now, I just want to touch on something that uh, Senator Green uh, was talking about in this so-called discount for the PBS scheme. That may sound very well at first, uh, at first intentions, but the point is, is that you need to ask the question, and I know this, there was a cholesterol drug called Liptor uh, that was actually a, a prescription drug that was painted by Pfizer. Now, the Australian government, this goes back a decade or so, was actually paying about $50 a uh, bucks for this particular drug. Um, and of course, Pfizer were collecting about forty dollars of the fifty dollars, right? So, but the, the the fact was was that the, there was a similar generic drug that came off patent that you could have bought for two dollars. So it's all very well saying that you're spending billions of dollars on the PBS, but the question needs to be asked whether or not there's suitable generic drugs out there that you can use that isn't going to line the pockets of rich pharmaceutical companies. Uh, so you know, I, I would like to see greater detail with this PBS scheme. But getting back onto the actual use of doctors and, and having these uh, priority schemes for doctors, the fact of the matter is, is that we've got an undersupply of doctors in this country, and we need to also uh, point the finger at our, uh, our um, 
the professional bodies of the medical industry, who quite frankly aren't training enough doctors here in this country. Now, I touched on this in my maiden speech, that it's an absolute insult that Australia, a first world country, is importing doctors from underdeveloped countries because our own AMA and our doctors are running a cartel in this country where they're restricting the supply of, of specialist services in order to make sure that they can maximise their fees. And we've got to have a serious look at this, and I, and I don't want to get you know, bipartisan here because I'm sick to death of the health issues that we've got in this country. But if we're meant to solve this problem, we really need to actually get one level of government taking responsibility for health full stop. And that requires, and you know, I'm, I'm happy to work with Labor on this, uh, and, I, and I mean this, because regional health is very, very important to me. You know, in the last 30 years, I've seen under the Queensland State Labor government, and I know that it happens in other areas, other states as well, the closure of over 30 maternity wards in regional Queensland. Now, that's a combination of factors, but one of those factors is that we just will not get doctors to go to the regions. They don't want to take on the insurance because, you know, they work in the private sector. We've got a problem with training nurses. Many nurses now either do general practice or midwifery, but they don't do both. If you want nurses out, out in the regions, you need to get them to do both be a G, uh, uh, get their general ticket as well as mum would always call it a general ticket um, and, and be a midwife as well because out there, there you know there isn't enough babies being born every day to have a full-time midwife they need to be able to also be general nurses as well um, but look at the end of the day here what we really need is is better front-end services and we need to so in order to do that I would like to see I would actually well I'd like to get rid of states altogether but it is absurd that we've got nine health bureaucracies in this country while our front end services are suffering and we've really got to get serious about having a big overview. If you want a job summit, I'll tell you what, you should have a health summit and I will turn up to that one, I guarantee you that. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And uh, I think you can see in that, that flow of consciousness contribution from Senator Rennick, as generous as it was in its intention, a, a bit of a map of the former government's way of planning the health sector, chaotic and destructive, not doing anything valuable that was actually going to stand up to Australia's real needs. Let me remind you of a bit Senator of Rennick. history. Senator Before Rennick. Medicare was— Excuse me, Senator O'Neill. Senator Rennick, you, you were heard in silence. I, I remonstrated with Senator Green. And I, I appreciate— So that's not— that. Senator, Senator Rennick, that's not a point of order. I appreciate it. I appreciate that you're very passionate about it, but Senator O'Neill is entitled to be heard in silence. Senator O'Neill, you have the call. Thank you very much. Just let's get to the reality of what Medicare does and why we're talking about GPs today. Because the government of the last nine years and its various iterations over the last few decades have attacked Medicare at every turn. The main cause of bankruptcy before Medicare was medical debt. People, Australians died or they sold their house. And finally, the Labor Party moved to make sure that that was no longer the case and Medicare was established. Now, in establishing that, we changed the course of the health of this nation in a very positive way. It was attacked relentlessly by every iteration of federal Liberal National Party government that came after. And that's what we've actually seen over the last nine years. So let's get a little bit of fact on the record here. So the reality that we confronted when the Rudd-Gillard government was established was there was a declining number of GPs being trained. We completely changed that and ramped up training our own because Mr Abbott's solution as health minister was to stop training Australians and bring overseas trained doctors. Short-term decision bad long-term decision. And the reality is that those wonderful GPs that we trained happened to come out into a, a medical profession that was being ripped asunder by the Abbott government. When they froze Medicare, they basically kicked out from underneath the business model of our GPs their sustainability as a practice. So what happened with those smart cookies who were training to be GPs? They came out, they had a look at these businesses in collapse, destroyed by the Australian government, and they said, well, hold on, 
I don't really want to be a GP anymore. We don't have a training problem in terms of the numbers. We have a problem of a broken business model that has destroyed GP practices across this country. Right across this country, it's the Liberal National Party who always pump themselves up as being great understanders of businesses that broke the, G the back of the GP business model for Australia. Now, the reality that we confront right now is because of that failure, because they broke access to GPs, they decided to tinker with this thing that they called the DPA, the, the District of Priority Distribution Priority Area. On the record in the other chamber today, the Minister for Health very clearly indicated that the changes that we were being asked about here today, the changes to the DPA that Labor has instituted, are changes that was a reverse to a cut made by the former government in 2019. A reverse to what that government had done in terms of denying Australians in this country access to a GP. They did that as a response to the failure of of their own policies in ruining Australians' access to GPs. And then they thought they could just shrink, shrink the places in which it was distributed. On the Central Coast, on the Central Coast, there was evidence given to our committee, and it was a Labor-instituted GP inquiry, GP shortage inquiry. It was our committee that determined the reality uh, to tell the reality of what's going on in Australia. Now, whether we were in Victoria, Queensland, New South Wales, or out in Wyala taking evidence, it was the same story everywhere. A completely ruined system. Communities in desperate need for doctors. And it's the responsibility of the former government that we do not have that workforce today. Now, Labor's come in. We've been here, what, 108 days. We can't undo everything that they did wrong. But this really egregious move of, of cutting the DPA in 2019 was a con job by the former government. It didn't fix the problem. It bought them time, but what it didn't do was give Australians access to the health care that they pay for and the health care they deserve. Labor is on to the job of fixing the mess that we have been left in the health sector by the former government. And Australians can trust. Australians who uh, the Labor Party who built Medicare will restore the integrity to the system that it deserves. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Scar. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Perhaps I can uh, strike a, a somewhat more conciliatory note as we uh, discuss what I consider is a very important issue, and that is, and that is the access of Australians to general practitioners across this country. And I might just, especially through you, Deputy President, for those in the gallery, uh, explain what we're talking about here, and that is what's referred to as distribution priority areas. And those areas which are classified as distribution priority areas, there are various incentives in place to attract medical professionals to go into those areas and be general practitioners. And those benefits to attract medical professionals into those areas include uh, international medical graduates and foreign graduates of accredited medical schools will have access to Medicare in DPA, those distribution priority areas only. So if their overseas medical practitioners come to this country, they can access Medicare as long as they're practicing in those areas. So the whole intention of this policy is to try and provide an incentive for that pool of professionals to provide general practice services to Australians living in those rural and regional areas. And that's the issue we're talking about. And I think, uh, in my view, Mr Deputy President, the system is broken. The system is broken. And we shouldn't be focusing so much on the history. Uh, we should be fo focusing on the way forward. The way forward. How do we fix the system? And we know the system is broken because the system has now there is such a lack of general practitioners practitioners, we now have the absurd situation where the incentives which are meant to be given to a medical practitioner to go to a place like Emerald in my home state of Queensland, which is three hours from Rockhampton, are the same as the incentives which are provided to medical practitioners to practice at Fishwick 13 or 15 minutes down the road from Parliament House. It doesn't make sense. 
It doesn't make sense. Of course they get sick, Senator O'Neill. Of course they do. But of course they do. But the issue, well, as I said, I'm trying to strike a more conciliatory tone and look forward. The issue is, if you're providing the same incentives, if you're providing the same incentives for someone to work 15 minutes down the road from Parliament House as you're providing to someone in Mildura over five hours from Melbourne or Emerald, three hours from Rockhampton, obviously the incentive isn't going to work. So the problem is so widespread around this country that there's a, there's a fundamental issue with the incentive system. There's a fundamental issue with the incentive system, and that's what we're talking about here. There's also, in my view, a fundamental system with the, what's referred to as the modified Monash, Monash model, which is the way in which different areas are categorised. And I've spoken to different communities across Queensland with respect to the application of that system. And to give you one example, a town in my home state of Rosewood is put in the same classification as, a, as Ipswich, which again is uh, one of my patron seats as a senator, and the demographics and the geographical challenges and the ability to attract medical staff is completely different between those two areas, but they're considered in the same category. It just it doesn't, this system, this modified Mount Monash system, does not reflect what happens on the ground, the realities of local communities. And it is a system which we really should look at. It really is. And uh, uh, I'd like to finally, with indulgence, um, thank someone who brought this to my attention, and that's Mr Lyle McEwen. And Lyle has served for many years as chair of an aged care facility in a little town called Rosewood. And he talked to me about his frustration in terms of, as, as the chair of a community organisation providing aged care services, he talked about the issue in terms of attracting health professionals to that aged care facility, when he's in the same category as Ipswich which is more of a major metropolitan centre. There are major, major issues with this, with this system, major, major issues in relation to this system and in relation to every Australian's legitimate expectation, legitimate expectation to be able to access health services, GP services in particular, whether or not they live in Mildura, whether or not they live in Fishwick, down the road from Parliament House or whether or not they live in Emerald in country Queensland. And, and that is something which all of us should be united in attempting to fix. I'll just put the question, Senator Faruqi, and then I'll, I'll give you the call. I'll put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, I take note of Minister Watt's response to my questions on the pay and conditions of early um, learning workers. Please proceed. The minister was talking very big. The rhetoric was very big. But where is the action to address the low pay and the really difficult conditions that early childhood educators are subjected to? There is none. Today, on Early Childhood Educators Day, thousands of early childhood educators have walked out of centres. Right now, they are gathering in the parliament's front lawns to give a message to the government and to all parliamentarians to say that enough is enough. And the Greens are right with early childhood educators as they shut down the sector today. We give them our full solidarity. But we give them more than that. They can be assured that we will be fighting for better pay for them, for better conditions, and for free and universal early childhood learning and care. In Parliament, needs to hear these calls for an immediate pay rise. Early childhood educators, who are now predominantly women, have been taken for granted for far too long. And they've also said, enough. They are burning out and they are leaving the sector in droves. Literally every week I meet some of these educators who are telling me that they are working more and more from 6 a.m. in the morning to very late at night. These are not conditions that educators or any workers should be subjected to. And educators do deserve professional pay that reflects the skill and the responsibility of the work that they do every single day. We know that early childhood education and care is an essential service, and it should be treated as such. It is critical for children 
in the early years of their development. And it should be well-funded, it should be universal, and it should be fee-free. We know that it benefits children, it benefits women, it benefits families, it benefits society, it benefits community. And yet, the can has been kicked down the road. <clears throat> the Greens are calling on the government to bring legislation to lift wages and to improve conditions of educators and deal with the critical workforce shortage in early learning and care. These steps, hand in hand with the Greens plan for free early learning and care for all, are absolutely vital to building a better future. So when will this government come to its senses and dump the $244 billion in stage three tax cuts, commit to essential public services like free and universal early learning and care, like giving early childhood educators and workers an immediate pay rise that they so well deserve. We need to make sure that educators has, have the best pay and conditions, and we need action on this right now. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I also uh, responding to Senator Watt or Minister Watt and thank uh, the minister for his response and follow-up. Uh, but I do want to also add that uh, the previous uh, government who actually uh, invented this new Aboriginality for uh, sovereign people, uh, created some um, heartache and pain to many families. Uh, we had an Aboriginal man who was deported, uh, who died uh, waiting six years as an Aboriginal man in another country for this government to uh, allow him back in the country. So he died waiting uh, and he came back in a body bag as a result. That family are still picking up the pieces. Uh, the number of children that this gentleman has is, are still reeling in the grief of not only not seeing their dad for six years, but then uh, he, their dad coming home in a body bag. So uh, this is an urgent uh, plea to the government to fix this problem, this uh, this decision that this um, the, the ex-government made that was di clearly discriminatory, uh, and we had a situation where we have the government or the parliament making decisions on who's Aboriginal and who's not in this country, which is going into very, very dangerous territory, uh, and it's not up to any uh, government to decide who's Aboriginal and who is not in this country. That, that completes. Um Motions to take. Oh, I'll put the question. Those of the questions say aye against, no, the ayes have it. That completes uh, the mo time allocated for motions to take note of answers. Are there any notices?